This past week, I've seen incredible pictures from all sorts of different celebrations of carnival, especially the ones of little children have stood out to me. Have you ever seen their eyes light up the first time they see a big carnival float or when they're carrying their beads around? They just, their eyes just light up with this sense of awe, with this sense of magic. And I think about that feeling. Perhaps you remember that feeling. As adults, it seems to come less often. Anybody else like we're in that sense of awe a little bit less often? But sometimes we feel it when we stand on top of a mountain. Or perhaps we feel it when we see someone or when we hold a newborn baby. Perhaps we feel it at other times. I remember one time that I had this sense of awe. I had just finished my master's degree in music. This was before I went to seminary. And as a celebration, I went to see the National Shrine to Music Museum. It's in Vermilion, South Dakota. And Vermilion is a tiny little town, and the, their claim to fame is this Shrine to Music Museum. And I saw all kinds of incredible things that I had wanted to see, some of them instruments that no longer exist anymore, like the Ophiclide. Um, it's a little bit similar to a bass trombone, but not exactly. I'm sure you could tell us even more about that. But one of the things that I saw there was a guitar made by Stradivarius. Now, Stradivarius is known for his violins. He's known for the beauty of the music that comes from them. And I played a trumpet that was named a Stradivarius. But what I saw was a guitar belt by him. It was one of those rare things. And then when I heard it played, it brought me to tears. It really surprised me, that moment of awe that just made me stop in my steps and brought me to tears, that rare moment. In our story for today, we have one of those rare moments, one of those moments that's completely unexplainable. I was talking about having the children act out the story because the transfiguration is one of those stories that's just hard to understand. But I think it's important for us to remember that in our faith, we have things that we understand and things that we don't. And that it doesn't make our faith any less strong if there are parts of it that we don't quite get. I wonder what sorts of things Peter and James and John heard and thought that day. When they were asked to go up and to pray on the mountain, it was something that probably happened fairly commonly. If we think about it, they went to pray on the mountain the night before Jesus died. But because they lived in a mountainous area, this was a common thing for them. So they go up this mountain to pray, and they're a little bit tired, and they see this bright light and then they hear the sounds of Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now, part of me wonders, how did they know that it was Moses and Elijah? I mean, Moses and Elijah had been gone for a very long time. They had died in the Old Testament. But yet somehow Peter and James and John realized that it was Moses and Elijah. But how long does it take them to realize it? How long does it take their mind to wrap around that something remarkable was happening and to begin to take it in? I think about those remarkable moments that change our faith, that change our understanding of things. We read later in the text that Peter is excited and he wants to build a shrine or, or a, a, a booth some translations will have for each of them, for Moses and for Elijah and for Jesus. You see, while he understands, and even earlier had said that Jesus was the Messiah earlier in the Luke text, he doesn't quite realize all of what it means for him. That's the thing about God, about realizing that God is our creator and our redeemer and our sustainer, is that through our entire lives we can grow to understand it more and more. And then in heaven, we still grow to understand God's love for us deeper and deeper. Perhaps a bit like some of the couples I've heard 
talk about how in love they were on their wedding day, but even more so 50 years down the road. How much more do we understand God's love for us now than we did two years ago, 20 years ago, or do we? This past week, I asked some of my friends to share with me about the times that they've come to change in their understanding of God, to change in their perspective, kind of like your perspective is a little bit different when you climb up on a mountain. And some of the things that they shared with me were these. One of them was about the understanding of time. That when they were in college, they were discussing predestination. The idea that God has predestined or predetermined the aspects of our life and whether or not we come to know God versus other ideas about how God experiences time. And they go on to share that they don't know why they realized it, but it occurred to them that God created time and that if God created time, then God existed outside of time. And that ever since then, it's helped them to see from a new perspective these arguments that happen between Christians. Are they happening just because we have a different viewpoint? I think about how we're so often taught that because one viewpoint is right, then the other one is wrong. And perhaps I I should have brought a picture of it, but maybe you've seen the image where two people are standing and they're looking at the ground and one of them sees a nine and one of them sees a six based on what they see. And my friend goes on to say that perhaps the arguments that we have are sometimes because we see from only our view. We see limited by time, and God does not. It helped my friend to realize that God is so much bigger than anything we can fathom. As I talked to others about when their experience of God changed, many of them shared about how they felt God's presence with them physically when they received a difficult diagnosis about how they knew and they had some sort of reassurance in their heart that they were not alone. I've not had that specific experience, but I have had one that many have told me about as well, that feeling of knowing that others are praying for you, of just knowing that even if you're alone in the room, not only is God there, but that others are lifting you up as well. I think about those times that our understanding of faith changes based not only on the things that we read in scripture but also the traditions that we've been raised in the reason the way that we think with our mind and the way that we experience god as united methodist christians we see all of these as part of our faith that scripture is the most important one but there's also tradition and reason and experience that make us understand things differently. I remember a while back one of the mothers of the Mother's Day Out children came by and was talking about having taken their child to Ohio on Christmas vacation and how everywhere they went they just kept pointing and saying levy, levy, levy at every hill. And it was because of their perspective that they saw a levy and not a hill and perhaps if the child came from Ohio to here it would be different. I wonder what we would look like if we, for just a moment, could see ourselves from God's perspective. And I don't stand here to claim and say that I could, but I will say that in those times in which I have considered how God sees us, that the way in which I understand God shapes my life drastically. And I believe that the ways in which we understand God shapes our lives and shapes our actions drastically. Growing up, I believed in a God who wanted to punish people, that this was God's primary purpose, was to to sit up there at a giant table and just wait for me to mess up so he could smack me down. 
I won't encourage you to raise your hands, but I'm sure that some of us have at least heard of that concept of God, that God was just waiting there to punish me. And so I remember as I grew older and I began reading things like 1 John where it says that God is love, or especially in John chapter 17, the Gospel of John, where Jesus is praying for us. For the people that came after the disciples that were there, the ones that weren't even yet born yet, and prayed for our unity, I began to think, what kind of God prays for people who haven't even been born yet, and who prays for their good? It made me think about something that Ed Elliott says. And Eliot speaks about how there is this concept out there that people believe sometimes that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. And he writes, as a young minister, I heard this so-called fact repeated many times. But every time I heard it repeated, something didn't sit right with me. Many years ago, I decided to do some research to find out for myself whether it was true. And what I discovered was that there are 1,900 plus verses in the four Gospels that contain Jesus' words. And only about 60 of those verses, or just 3% of them, might be construed as either directly or indirectly referring to a place called hell. And actually, I just want to take an excursus right there. This word that gets translated hell is actually Gehenna. And it was an actual physical place that was a trash pile. But he goes on to say, on the other hand, there are more than three times as many verses in the Gospels in which Jesus refers to heaven, eternal life, or his coming kingdom. 192 verses in all, or almost 10%. So how is it that sometimes we think that God speaks so much more about judging us rather than about promising us a good future. And I think it's perspective, isn't it? It's that perspective. It's, it's a place where we all have spaces to grow. Whether it's a perspective about whether God is more loving or more judging or about whether God is more this or that or the perception of whether God is with us or not. The fact is that God is so huge that we are not going to understand in this life. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. I think about how Peter's life changed because he knew Jesus. About how he went from being a fisherman in Galilee, who most of us, dare I say none of us, would have ever heard of if he hadn't met Jesus to writing a portion of our scripture, to telling thousands about the love of God. I think about that, that perspective. And I remember seeing a poster that was looking down over a house, and it showed all the walls, and it said, the walls that defied us don't reach all the way up to heaven. So I think about the things that divide us, I think about the fears that we have and the love, too. Because, you see, fear and love are two of the greatest motivators. And one is an enjoyable motivator and one's not. Now, you all know that I don't have any kids, but I think about when I've kept my nephews or my niece. And when they do what's right because they want to please their auntie or please their parents, or when they do what's right because they're afraid of what would happen. Now, which is more enjoyable? Whether you're a parent or whether you are uh, an auntie or whether you're a teacher, isn't it better for people to do things because they're driven by love than being driven by fear? So part of what I want us to think about here is how they experience this moment on the mountain. That perhaps part of the reason that they were quiet in that moment was because they were afraid. Perhaps the reason that they didn't tell the story of this event until later is because they were afraid. When we have those experiences of God that don't fit into a box, sometimes we're afraid to tell them. That feeling of that presence that's beside you. That warm feeling that John Wesley felt in his heart 
before he began the Methodist movement. I think about those gifts that God gives us sometimes in grief, where we feel the presence of the one who has gone before us. Those things that cannot be explained. Like this day on the mountain. They are part of our faith, and while they are critically important, they're not the majority of our day-to-day life, are they? I don't know if you noticed, when I talked about there being 1,900 plus verses where Jesus speaks in the Gospels, there were about 60 referring to punishment, about 190 referring to heaven or eternal life. Now, I'm not great at math, but this colleague of mine who was working on these numbers said that means that that leaves 87% of the time where Christ talks about this life about our relationships with God and our relationships with each other, and how we are to navigate this life, experiencing God's love and light. Last night, I woke up like about 3 or 4 a.m., and I kept hearing the horns honking on the river. And I looked out the window, and it was really foggy, and I thought, well, if it's foggy outside my bedroom window, then it must be very foggy on the river. And I think about the scripture that tells us that now we see in a mirror darkly, and then we will see face to face. How much of our life now is fogged by our own faulty perception? How much of our life now is fogged by those things that we're afraid of? How much of those things right now are fogged because of some of the choices that maybe even we didn't make but others made? And what would it look like if we prayed for that moment to see the glory of God's face the way that Peter and James and John did? What would it look like if for a moment we prayed that God would allow us to see ourselves in the light that God sees us? As one who created us with love, as one who has woven us into parts of a larger story. Because you see on that day on the mountain, it didn't just change Peter and James and John's life. It changed the way that they understood Jesus. They understood that even Jesus' life on earth was part of a larger story. He stands with Moses, who led the people to physical freedom. And Christ is going to lead them to spiritual freedom. They stand there with Elijah, who was the prophet that told them about the Christ coming. And they stand with the Christ, who brings about a new kingdom, not only in heaven, but here on earth. And they stand there and watch him transformed. And they begin to realize that Christ is part of a bigger story, but that he is the biggest part of the story. When I first became a pastor, or or I guess I'd been a pastor a couple years, but when I first became a full-time pastor, I spoke with a retired pastor, and he told me these words about preaching. And I keep a copy of them in my office and consider them from time to time. And he says, don't craft a story about yourself that holds God. Craft a story about God that holds you. And as I've pondered that over the years, since 2014 when I was given that, I've begun to think it's about a whole lot more than preaching. It's about life. Are we crafting a story about us that holds God? Or are we crafting and being crafted as part of a story about God that holds us. And what difference does that make? And what freedom does that give if it's not all about us, if it's not all about our decisions, and it's about God's work before we were born and after we're gone? In a way, it gives us a freedom. It allows us to place in God's hands those things that belong in God's hands and frees us for a better future. 
Peter, James, and John left that day, and they were quiet for a while. They were speechless, as it says, at the time and told no one what they had seen. Perhaps they needed time to understand what God was doing. Perhaps they needed time to reflect. This week we begin that holy season of Lent in which we intentionally set aside time or perhaps set aside specific desires or specific things to focus on that relationship with God. In this Lent, I'm going to encourage you to consider what it would mean to give up some of the fears that you have and to be set free from them in order to embrace a a spirit of power, love, and self-control. And that'll be our theme this Lenten season. From Scripture, we're taught God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and self-control. If Peter and James and John had stayed frozen by that fear in that moment, if they had never told their story, we might not be here today. What does God want to set us free from? What does God want to shine light upon and bring a new future for? God will do it in mysterious ways, and in mundane ways. God will do it in love. Might we open ourselves to a new perspective, to a new way of understanding God's deep, deep love for us. Amen.